Hello, and welcome to the Screen Composer Studio, a podcast about the musical storytellers behind some of your favorite films, shows, video games, and more. I'm your host, Adrian Ellis. Called one of the most compelling acts Canada has to offer by Time magazine, Sarah Sleen has been beguiling audiences since she first appeared on the scene in the late 90s, when she was signed to Atlantic Warner at just 19 years of age. Her infectious combination of piano-forward pop and cabaret and her singular voice propelled her to acclaim. The four-time Juno nominee with 11 albums under her belt was classically trained and fascinated by sound and orchestration early on. She wrote arrangements and instrumental pieces for her albums and eventually went on to provide orchestral arrangements for the likes of Dan Mangan and Hawksley Workman. A storyteller in the truest sense, she has also worked as a painter, a poet, a broadcaster, and even did a stint of acting for which she was nominated for a Gemini. Now Sarah is taking all of her talents and background and applying them to help tell stories for the screen. In this endeavor, she's already met with success, winning a CSA for Detention Adventure alongside collaborators Ari Posner, Amin Batia, and Antonio Naranjo. Deeply philosophical and highly articulate, Sarah is able to speak about her work and life as an artist in a way that is both illuminating and inspiring. If you like what you hear, please consider giving us a rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. It really helps us grow and share the stories of these amazing creators. And now, please enjoy this brilliant conversation with the ever scintillating Sarah Sleen. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Adrian. It's nice to be here. Yeah, super excited for this conversation. A um, little bit of a left field thing, maybe a non-starter, maybe just a softball question, but one of the uh, uh, one of the interviews I read with you, they had, and this is from uh, a little ways back, this is from '99. They uh, a little ways. <laughs> <laughs> they gave uh, they gave a bunch of stats off the top, and one of them was your uh, star sign, which is Gemini. Uh, do Just you follow- barely. What's that? Just barely. Just barely. Oh, so you're a cuspy cusp cusp. Do you follow your horoscope at all? Oh my God, are you peering into my mind? <laughs> <laughs> this is a thing I, I don't like to tell people, but I kind of do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I love I, I love a lot of the public intellectuals follow their podcasts, like Sam Harris and people like that. Right. And uh, I would be embarrassed to admit <laughs> we won't anywhere tell publicly that I like listen to, you know, my forecast. But sometimes I do. I listen to the yearly ones for sure. And sometimes they're very accurate. Uh, do you know Rob Bresney? Yes, and he. I was religious about reading his in the Now magazine when I yeah. lived when I was like a teenager and in my twenties. I was obsessed with him. I mean, I I I would have to say that I'm probably on. I, I skew more to the side of the Sam Harris argument on the whole thing, whether I think it's legit or not or whatever. But I mean, there is a kind, and I do read Rob's every once in a while. And I like what I like about his is it's sort of this sort of very abstract thing, like you know a you know some very odd description of some scenario that's all of just metaphor and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and sort of imagery and allegory. And what it does for me is it just kind of sets my brain going, Oh, like let's connect these different things. Or what do I think about yes. this? Or maybe if I look at it from this weird perspective. Yes. And you know what? Life is like that. That is the language that life speaks. And mm. I am one of those people, you know, as, as great as, left brain thinking and hardcore empiricism, all the things it has achieved in this world, um, I still think that the universe is a living thing and it's Mm. speaking to us and communicating to us all the time. And, you know, those two things can coexist in one brain. I am living proof. So, (laughs) yeah, I I actually, there's a, a really fascinating book that I recommend to all people who even brush on this topic. It's called Cosmos and Psyche. Okay. And it's by a an historian who named Richard Tarnas, who before he want this was the book he always wanted to write, but before he wrote that book, he wrote a book called The Passion of the Western Mind, which, you know, like won all these prizes and all of the respectable scholarly community was like, wow, bravo, excellent work, Mr. Tarnas. <laughs> and he's like, great, thank you. Now that you have all acknowledged that I am a legitimate scholar, right. here's my book on astrology and how it may just be legit. And everyone was like, <laughs> you know, like, whoa. It's brilliant and rigorously researched. Interesting. So, like, yeah, it's wild. I mean, it's a slog to read. It's not like fun, light reading. It's really intense, but it's so extraordinary, the the ideas he puts forth. It's just, huh. yeah. 
you can would you, love like, it. <laughs> can you nutshell like one of the basic premises? Like, because I mean, yes. one of the things I find, I mean, other than, well, the moon controls the tides, that's a pretty powerful effect that a, you know, a heavenly body has on the earth. And apparently also like there's a bunch of stuff with the moon, like, um, and, and births, like when, when, uh, like statistical uh, rates of birth will happen around certain moon cycles and things like that. But beyond that, I'm like, yeah, but like controlling the way politics go and like how your personal life is like women and the moon. I mean, the, the moon makes our bodies do things, right. you know, and our brains and hearts are in our bodies and they're made of earthly flesh. You know, there's. So basically, in a nutshell, the book is saying that the planets, uh, according to the way astrology works, and, you know, planets have, they govern houses, which are like subjects in your life, which cannot, of course, empirically be true. It just mm. cannot. That's mm -hmm. ridiculous, right? But he's saying that these planets have energies. And w what does that mean? It sounds like very airy-fairy and chakra-y and like, you know, what, what does that even mean? But, you know, for instance, Saturn if you think about this planet, it's absolutely enormous, but the, the energy that it brings is like struggle, difficulty, hardship, like seemingly immovable obstacles. And he, he goes on to describe like some hardcore science about the history of these planets, their orbits, their moons, like everything. Jupiter is, you know, the planet of good fortune in astrology. And he goes on to explain, you know, like, various historical events. That's the part that's fascinating about the book. I know ah. this has nothing to do with screen composed, <laughs> but that's the fascinating part of the book is that he goes over history and he tries to show you like this general pattern of energy is shown in these, the rhythms of this planet. You can see a, uh, a very related, a, almost correlated. Right rhythm in these historical things and he will he will show you that map and it's you know like i think people who are hardcore left brain would say well he's cherry picking but it's like right. some of this you just can't deny it's just i feel like you should read it and then we can chat That's at super length about fascinating. <laughs> um do you know of uh, brian eno's oblique strategies no so brian eno developed i don't know if he did this on his own or with somebody else but he developed these set of basically they're playing cards and they sort of do the same thing for musicians or that's what they're intended for. They're intended for the studio or for creative periods where, you know, you might be sort of sitting there going, I don't know what to do next or I'm stuck or how do I work myself out of this hole? And they're just like, there's weird little suggestions. Like what if you took out the middle or uh, what if the most important thing was the least important thing? Just something is like, you're, you're going to look at some of them going, I don't know, what that's not. But then something will come up and you're like, oh, yeah, if I, I just, did that, like, what if everything had angles? Okay, oh, what does that man. mean? We want the guitar to be angular. We want the bass to be angular. We want the drums to be angular. You know, it's, it's you know another. You know how cool that is? I, a long time ago, like maybe 2006 when I was living in Paris, a writer who I, who was, you know, I was really in the pop scene at that time. Uh, my records were coming out of, in Paris, like in France and Germany and Sweden. So I was over there living there and she was like just becoming very famous at the time. And she randomly sent me a note and said, um, come to Spain. We're in Spain. And wow. I was in Paris. So I went there and th she's this crazy, weird writer chick. <laughs> <laughs> and she she's become quite quite celebrated now. But the gift that she gave me that you're reminding me of right now is the I Ching. Ah, yes. Have you right. heard of this? Yep. So what you're getting at, and I guess what Brian Eno is getting at, is you know randomness. It, it, how is randomness possible in a world of complete connectivity, where l every atom is affected by every other atom? Mm-hmm. So these chants, the card you pick out of that deck, there are all kinds of causational <laughs> threads that are bringing you to that card. This is what the I Ching would argue, right? And this is, you know, like I sometimes actually roll the I Ching when I'm creatively blocked. Cool. And it it will open little doors in there. And I mean, like, I don't know if you've read any Terrence McKenna and all those whacked out mm -hmm. Americans who did way too many <laughs> mushrooms back in the day. Absolutely. But his whole thing was these hexagrams in the, the I Ching 
um, correlate to like human DNA. There's all kinds of whacked out connections that he made. But mm. I do think that, that the element of randomness in a, a universe that is so interwoven like ours is is really fascinating. I have friends who are brilliant computer scientists. Like there's this one guy, uh, he knows so much about computers. Like it's frightening to me. He knows every, he can, I can call him and he'll be at Costco and he can find the like <laughs> 12th menu in the sub menu, right? He's just walking around and he knows where, he can tell me where it is. This guy does numerology because oh, wow. he, he's like, of course, this is not empirically true in the way that, you know, two plus two is four, but the, that element of, uh, what we call randomness and all the causative threads that are everywhere that we're embedded in that we cannot escape. They are for whatever reason, compelling you to make certain choices that seem, feel, look to all outside observers to be random mm -hmm. purely. Yeah. And I think that's super cool. Uh, so a while back, I, I sort of had to put the brakes on use of social media and uh, being really sort of like watching the news and all this stuff for various reasons, most of which were mental health related. And one of the things that I realized or one of the th one of the things that happened to me among many other extremely positive effects was that I felt like there was this sense of magic about the world that kind of returned. And I was shocked that I had not noticed its absence consciously. And all of a sudden it was back. Oh. I'm like, oh, right. This is what it, this is what it's like to feel like I want to write music because I want to say something about this magical feeling in the world. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not specific. It's not like, you know, some sort of, you know, Kabbalistic thing or, you know, I'm going to go join a coven or something like that. But there is something that's related to, I think that human, um, that human uh, way that we're pulled towards those kinds of ideas that we're trying to explain something that isn't explained by anything else. And I think that's what you're sort of saying by, you know, there's the whole uh, left brain way of thinking about things that has a gap. And I think especially yes. for creative people, that gap is problematic. Sacred. That, gra yeah. that gap is sacred space. It must be guarded. It yeah. must, we must build fences around that sacred space. That's a temple. That's a shrine. And honestly, I think it's so interesting what you say about social media because I find the same and I can I am astonished by my insatiable hunger for it when I return to it. Mm. Like you check it 3000 times, you can't help yourself. It's Yeah. It's frightening, right? But the what strikes me about the saddest part of social media is how how deeply it, it trains us to be passive mm. in terms of our imaginative faculty. Our, our capacity to picture mentally. We just pour images into our heads. Whereas when I was a child and I went outside for recess, I was imagining fairies and elves and I was creating whole communities of these people in sketchbooks and I was giving them costumes and writing uh -huh. down their superpowers. And like my mind was producing the images. I right. was not being spoon fed the images all day and weakening, allowing that capacity to atrophy, right? So that's, I, I think that's so interesting that you feel that sort of, the word is revivification mm. of your, your inner image making capacity, your inner creative light. Yep. And I, I think that's what's dangerous about social media. It really, it can take up all of that space and cause that muscle to get weak. What other practices do you have that you... Uh, that are helpful to you in terms of maintaining that sense of magic about life and that you can tap into in order to be more creative? What a beautiful question. That's, that's the question I ask all my artist friends uh, who I cherish tremendously because the, all of their answers are always different. Mm. Um, but for me, it is almost always nature, ah. almost always. And I mean, I used to be a, an avid meditator and I've kind of fallen off that wagon. I intend to get back on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always intend to get back on. But a walk, I have lived uh, all kinds of places in the world, but I always need to be right. I felt m the most kind of like disconnected when I don't have access to an open space, mm. to the sky, to at least some trees, something I can look at to, you know, 
make that connection again. But now I'm closer to the country in my new house and I can go for a walk and I can just, it's that feeling that you are observing a landscape and it is also observing you. It's presence, capital P. Like it's very hard to find that in the glowing rectangle. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's it's not in there. And yet it's like when I'm looking in there, when we're all looking in there, what are we looking for? Probably it. Mm. And it's we know that it's not there. It's yeah. it's in other people's eyes. It's in the forest. It's it's in, you know, open places where we feel the aliveness of the universe. Mm. And that's also externalized, right? As opposed to, I think what you're talking about with the glowing rectangle is that everything you're doing is ego-based. You're trying to get people to validate your existence and you're looking for that. You're hoping for that to happen constantly over and over again. And yeah, you neither find that nor do you find that larger sort of, you know, that, that view into something bigger than you that doesn't have to do with your own ego. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Like it's almost, it's so... The feeling that I have when I am in the land of social media, I mean, like, sometimes it's so great for laughs, too. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, finding something funny and and having a, a light moment in your day. But I, I do find that it reminds me of that Buddhist idea, the hungry ghosts. Yes. That you, you just, you will never have enough. You'll never, you can't get at the itch. And it's, and we know it's not going to feel at ever at rest. Satisfied. Okay. I am now an Instagram success. <laughs> you know, it's like I did it. I finished there, Facebook. there is no destination. <laughs> yeah. And it's the other sad part of it is like it's a it's not a real place. It's no. not a real place. This yeah. these are not real lives. These and are even the people you know are they're not they're real people. Like I always 100%. find like I like the people that I really love less when I see them on social media or when I it's yeah. like this, there is a barrier there. Yeah, it's really, it's uh, yes. it's a problematic thing. But I like this, uh, I, I wanted to pull on that thread of, of the idea of magic and sort of this like, um, yeah, the way that you sort of train your brain and you sort of talk about it like atrophying if you don't work it. It's a muscle you have to work. It's a, There are practices around that to sort of get to a place where, and I think it's especially important for, you know, media composers because you're doing this on a deadline. You're doing it to satisfy very specific demands, and you need to do it uh, right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If not yesterday. <laughs> so when does music enter your life? Do you have an earliest memory of music that sort of had a profound impact on you? You know, my brother was an absolutely, he was such a gifted athlete that I think as a young kid, I was like, all right, that's out. Uh, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, I, I want some awards, you know, um, as little kids do. But I was also, my mom and dad had a, an upright piano in the house that my mom used to play at Christmas. It was a very familiar story. Lots of people have this same story. And I was very drawn to this thing. And I also think it was a very spiritual connection I had with the woman who owned it. This is my um, maternal mom's sister. Yes. Mm-hmm. My mom's aunt. So she had this beautiful, tragic story. She was always very artistic. She was kind of the only artist in her family. Really, really sad life, sad story, but had such a, you know, those people that just, they make a room beautiful yeah. and they, they can do a little adjustments to your, to a dress with like a seamstress and it's suddenly beautiful. She was that kind of person. She's just elegant. She didn't have a lot, but she just had a, a, an artistic eye and she loved music and um, I just was so drawn to this very humble little apartment-sized Heinzman. And of all the things my parents very optimistically put me in, uh, it was the only one that stuck. I mean, I'm not going to be a potter. It's just not on the cards. And T-ball was out. <laughs> and I just loved music so much. So they had a very small record collection too. They had a, a few LPs. They were huge music fans. Oh wow! Um, but music appreciators for sure. Okay. So where where did it come from for you? Like where was that? Uh, where were the references? I know you talk a little bit about Joni Mitchell, Jeff Buckley, Tor Amos. Like when does that enter, and and how did those sort of where does that come from? I think 
as I was coming of age, like I went through the conservatory system from, you know, age four all the way through. I went to university for piano performance my first year before I was pulled away by the CD <laughs> underworld of rock and roll music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, sh- but, the shallow plastic trench. Right. <laughs> never heard it called that before but it's pretty accurate well that's uh that's an old hunter s thompson quote that he look that one up after we're done here it's incredible it's so damning it's it's pretty funny we gotta share book lists adrian (laughs) i feel like you're a very well-read man um but yeah so i went through the whole conservatory system and i think as a lot of people um i just loved classical music i was i was that person like going to the library and getting out like cassettes of the Hilliard ensemble. Like, wow. I was like so unconcerned with being cool. I just had this very pure love of of beautiful music. And I wasn't really I didn't I hadn't discovered like bands or songwriters okay. until my teens. And in my yeah. teens I was like I had my mind and my world opened by, you know, other teenagers who were obsessed with music and I began to find things that I really, really loved and identified with. And there were a couple people that completely like made the connection for me in my mind. Like, cause I was this classical piano girl. That was one box in my mind. And then the mm-hmm. other box was like, Oh my God, you know, like I love this Joni song or this band song or whatever. And then Tori Amos came along and I was like, you can do this with the <laughs> piano. This is allowed. And she blew my heart open because it was so emotional too. It was so emotional and real. And I was so affected by the way she sang. And and then I met through CD PJ Harvey, who was like raunchy and trashy and masculine and, and like frightening and fell madly in love with her. And then it just, you know, I became more and more and more obsessed and more interested in recording and you know, and then I went down that track and and bye bye conservatory. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really interesting. So you never had any kind of other than being put into conservatory. That was that your first sort of view into classical music, or was that being played at home? Or like, because I mean, for me, I was a pit brat. Like, I mean, I basically grew up around classical music. Both musician, more musician parents, and it was almost like this is the religion. Anything else doesn't really. Count. Oh wow! Right, it was. It was I was pretty... never subjected to that pit pit brat. <laughs> pit, well, that's actually my term. I don't know if that's a serious thing, but I was just always hanging. Like I was around rehearsals. Right. I was around practice. I was in the pit. I was watching re- rehearsals. Oh, how it was, lovely! Yeah, it was great. It was amazing. I would have loved that. No, I I just naturally loved classical music, and it didn't stress. I was totally blissfully ignorant of all the trappings right. around. You know the classical world. And I think actually to this day, I mean, I, I understand them more now. And I think because I was not sort of indoctrinated with that, I, I, I kind of don't, it doesn't bother me. So this is why I like waltz into the world of orchestras singing as a pop singer. And I kind of am not intimidated by it, right? which actually, you know, kind of serves me well because, um, I probably should be. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm not, you know, because it's like, I don't profess to be an opera singer. I am a unique musician and I, yeah. I'm a creator. I'm yeah. a creative person. I sing with my voice. Um, and I go there and I, I, I feel, feel empowered by not having like that kind of drilled into my head that this was like, right. this is the pure classical world and this is something else. And, yeah. you know, never the twain shall meet. Uh, one of your one of the things I've read you say was the phenomena of sound itself is a muse for me. When does 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 when does the idea of production and the idea of arrangement uh, figure into what you're doing and what you're interested in? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I just I'm looking for. I am so affected by beautiful music. Mm. I really am. I. I mean, I I still go to see the symphony. I when I am rehearsing with an orchestra, I just I get my eyes fill up. It's pathetic. <laughs> I'm yeah. <laughs> all these years later, I still like a beautiful string arrangement of a song or or someone singing a, a beautiful lyric to a beautiful melody. I'm, 
piano melody, that Gonzalez record. Oh man. You know, like I just good melodies. I still I'm still profoundly moved by them and I still I get so much pleasure from them. Yeah. So when I'm making something, I am kind of hoping to move myself in the same way as I would feel when I'm, you know, sitting listening to the TSO play the score to Out of Africa, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which was, I fully sobbed through. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, I just, and, and strings really, really do that for me. I feel as um, carriers of emotion, they're unsurpassed. Right. Yeah, and maybe that's an old school way, uh, an old school opinion, but it's still my opinion, and that's why <laughs> I I use them all the time because I just think they speak so directly to human beings. You know, our bodies really haven't changed much in two thousand years, and has it been that long? Maybe more. Um, and we're we're flesh and blood. We are we are matter. Mm-hmm. And we're, you know, when you move the air in a certain way, it, you know, all of us are going to feel it. And I, I just love that. I love the simplicity of, you know, it's right there to you. We can all make it. So to date, as an artist, you've made 11 albums or put out 11 albums, which is an incredible body of work. Um, Thank you. Tell me a little bit about like the beginnings of that, because you were very young uh, when you got signed. What was what was that like entering the world of the business of music now at that time? Yeah, they get them young because <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you get hip to what's going on, um, then you're like, wait a second, and then they're like, next. Um, yeah, no, you know what? I it's funny. The pop music world is what it is, and you know, looking back now, I I think would I should I have you know, sort of steered away from it? No, because I left university halfway through because I was, I felt like, you know, I felt this thing's going to happen. I'm mm. going to get a record deal and I'm going to start recording albums. Wow. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> and and people were like, I, I remember, I'll never forget this. I was working at the Swiss Chalet on Bloor Street in Toronto, Ontario as the bartender. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember telling the guys in the back, oh, yeah, I'm getting a record deal. And they're like, whatever. And I'm like, no, it's happening. Like, I am literally going to New York City wow. and I'm going to sign a record deal. And they're like, listen to this chick, you know. And then a month later, I quit. And I was like, guys, I got a record deal. Um, but, you know, like, you can't pass up an opportunity like that. Yeah. So I went and it was my parents were kind of heartbroken that I had left university. Mm. I went back and I finished my degree, but um, I went on this whirlwind ride and we did all all the crazy things that happened. Yes, there was a lot, a lot of difficulty too, a lot of loneliness, a lot of feeling like you are not in the driver's seat of your life because Mm. you are waiting for opportunities, waiting for people in higher positions to say, okay, you, or this is, this can happen now. But at the same time, you're also getting these experiences that such a small percentage of the world would have ever gotten to have. You know, it's I was recording in Bearsville. I had, you know, this massive budget for my first album. I had, you know, the greatest engine, one of the best engineers in the world working on my album. I was writing horn arrangements for the Rolling Stones horn section, like on the day of, just too, too young to like know really how awesome all this stuff was that right. was happening, you know? And I I think back and I think like, would I have done any of it differently? And I'm like, well, because of all the the way that was all linked, no. Right. And I, I like it's hard to have a unique path, as most artists know, probably yourself included, because you see everyone else, kind of all your friends or, you know, the people you grew up with, like everybody's kind of on a similar track Mm -hmm. and they reach milestones and you just kind of are, you feel like an outsider looking in. Like, I think I wrote a song about this actually, like who lives in those well-lighted homes with their windows aglow in the evening. Mm. (laughs) Like I was just kind of, I felt like I was 
I was watching everyone move on with their lives and I was kind of in this weird holding pattern right. after a while, going around and around. Like the circle was, you know, write, record, release, tour, write, record, release, tour, right? And you feel like you're going a hundred miles an hour and big, intense feelings are happening. The incredible highs of playing big shows and the incredible highs of having bigger audiences, the incredible highs of like going to foreign countries, seeing the world, but the incredible lows of like, and I haven't seen my friends in how long? And I don't have a partner and I'm, you know, like, and all these things, like you feel in, in other ways, your life was at a standstill. So it, it was like, I wouldn't trade it. I really wouldn't. There were so many beautiful moments along that journey that I feel like is now really, I'm a totally different track, but um, I, I still feel like really unlimited as an mm. artist. I feel like I, uh, you know, once the veil uh, has been lifted and you're like, oh, I can really, I can be in the driver's seat and I don't have to, you know, wait for anything or anyone. And that's more so the situation now than ever. Mm. So, yeah. This idea of the circle, the, the right release tour, uh, return, try to get your life together to really, to write and release another album. I think at some point you return, you were, you talk about this as being the swamp that when you return this painful period of self excavation that has to happen where you basically have all those experiences that you had while you're doing that. And then you come back with these gifts for your audience, essentially like, here's what I discovered while I was, you know, on this uh, exploratory journey. Uh, how does that change for you? Do you find that that's still a process that you have to go through where, where it's this kind of like almost a hero's journey that's writ over and over again, we have to leave home and the fires of, of the hearth and, and go and explore and take chances and risks and go through a painful, uh, you know, self excavation and then return with the gifts. He's read Joseph Campbell too, folks. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Um, yes. And I think, I think every artist has, uh, has that set of seasons and it, some are, some go through them very quickly and lightly and hang on to none of them. Some breeze right through them. I know people that breeze right through them mm. and it has always been torturous for me. Always. It's like a labor and, and giving birth truly. It has, and all of my people in my inner circle say the same. They're like, <laughs> going to make another record. Oh God. You know, it, and I, it probably doesn't need to be. And I feel like as I got older, like I really did feel for me to make an authentic record, I had to have transformed in some way. Yeah, right. I had to have changed. And it, it was important to me to do that before I, you know, said to the world, you should listen to what I've made, right. you know, because I felt like that was, that was the deal. I want to say something to you because I think it's important mm -hmm. about my soul's evolution. It might help you on yours. You know, right. yeah. that was my philosophy. And so I think when I was younger, with such a tumultuous life that was always changing and always pretty high intensity and a, a vast spectrum of things I was experiencing and feeling, there was a certain level of intensity that maybe you can handle when you're emotionally not formed when you're slightly immature and you, you can allow for the cartoonish extremes, <laughs> but as you become more of a whole person and you become more integrated, um, my records, they got further and further and further apart. The last ah. record I made and released was in 2017. Mm. And before that it was 2011, you know, and it's also because I've been branching out and doing other things and exploring all these other areas of music, musical theater, screen composing. But again, it's it's that I don't want to bring you anything unless it's gold. You know, like I'm not going down in the mine for like a snack. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to bring you back. I found. I'm going to bring you back something exquisite to eat. You know, right. right? And yeah, I and I think wait, there's a was, mine that makes food. You can get food from this mine. This is a, I want to know where this mine is. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But when you're young, you know, like you can speed through those cycles and you're like, you're okay with making KD, right? Like you're just like, oh, yeah. and then I had a relationship and we broke up and then I was sad, but then I was happy and I drank too much. And, you know, like I, I don't know who that person is anymore. And as I've said many times before in, in interviews, as a recording artist, you have such a unique time capsule of the way you've evolved. Right. Even my singing voice has changed so dramatically since the late 90s, so dramatically. Right. And in fact, can I tell you a story? Please. Really? Yeah. Okay. I feel like you are you are maybe the perfect receptive audience for this story. Okay, awesome. I'm super excited. And I will try to make it not long-winded, but... Well, this is a long-form podcast. You can make it as long as you want. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> I've, this is a very... This is a, this is a deeply symbolic and important story to me because I I think it speaks to what I was saying earlier of to my conviction that the universe is alive and speaking okay. to us constantly. Yeah. And that artists have that unique trust in that or maybe a slighter uh, uh, more attuned perception to that. And that's why society needs them and mm. l- loves slash doesn't care about them enough, right? <laughs> right. Because you know, it's also threatening to the like many of us that are sound yep. asleep. Um mm. So I, when I started out in my late nineties or the late nineties, and I got that record deal, that big record deal that seemed to come out of nowhere, that was this confluence of lucky factors, right? Like female singer songwriters were really huge at the time. And I was just that, it just was this amazing synergy of things that, and this luck. And I got, you know, swept away on this ride, but as a person, I was very, as I said, unformed. I don't know anyone who was fully formed at 18, but yeah. I was very unformed, very afraid and unprepared for any kind of spotlight. Kind of like a bookish kid who went to the library for tapes of the Hilliard Ensemble, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> that person does not want to be on a stage with Maria Carey. Like, no. Right. Yeah. And so I invented an alter ego. And this was not a sort of deliberate, this person's going to be, you know, the mask I wear. But essentially, that's what it was. I invented this person called the Baroness. Oh. And I started painting her. And it really was just this natural thing that came out of my imagination. This woman in this beautiful regal gown with this incredible dignified pose, kind of like Kate Blanchett, like, excuse me, world. <laughs> Here I am in all of my glowing power, you know, just strength, yeah. audacity, this like Big, blue, crazy, shining hair. Just a queen. And I painted this woman many times. The first painting of her is on the back of my Atlantic debut. And then there were many other incarnations of this painting. One I started in about 2001. And it was a woman, well, this woman, the Baroness, in a red dress, the gorgeous red dress that I'd always painted her in, with her wild blue hair done up sort of, you know, late 1800s kind of way. And she's sitting very dignified in front of an upright piano. There's a man here sitting also. And then there's all these musicians behind her holding instruments. You know, like um, violins, cellos, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, this was like the secret underground orchestra and the Baroness was the, you know, she wrote the music and conducted this incredible orchestra. And what, a, <laughs> what an amazing character. And she was fearless, Right. And this painting I started and was unfinished in various stages of incompletion for 20, almost 20 years. Wow. So then in 2014, I get a random call. 2014 was around the time that I'd, that was my last major tour. Okay. I was exhausted. I was like, I'm not, I was divorced. I was, you know, had no babies. I was like, I'm not, I need to just... And just collect myself and think about what the next 10 years are going to look like. And then I get this random call out of the blue. We need a person for a movie who can play the Chopin Ballade in G minor. Can you send us a photo of your hands and your measurements? (laughs) And I'm like, what? So I do all the things. I jump through all the hoops. I'm hired as Jessica Chastain's body double oh, wow. in Guillermo del Toro's 
movie, Crimson Peak, that was filming at Casa Loma. Right. So I'm like, wild. Like, I, I never get these calls. And it had gone through, like, two people that I'd only, like, I'd only met once, right? It was just so random, as yeah. we were, were saying before. <laughs> so I get the job, and I'm like, well, how cool is that? I have the same measurements as Jessica Chastain. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm all happy about that. Very excited to be on set with Guillermo, because right. he's brilliant, obviously. And thrilled. Get there. They're suiting me up. They're measuring me. Before then, I had to go to... to um, get a fitting because it was a very elaborate costume. So there's like a bustle, there's sleeves, there's like collars. It's it's like in six pieces almost. So they're suiting me up and nothing is clicking in my brain yet that this is a red gown. Right. Like exactly the red gown I have painted at least four times. So, and then they're fitting the wig on my head. And again, I'm just like, it's going, then we get on set and it's, Late 1800s, and <laughs> there's piano. They want me to play the Chopin ballad on this piano. There's people in the room dancing in these dresses, and if I could show you an entire portfolio of my visual art and compare it with the costumes in this film, you would be shocked. It is almost as if I had the film was. I don't know what it is. It's a ripple in space time. So we're doing the scene where Jessica's character's at the piano. She plays, so it's got to be me, the back of me. Then they want to get the shot where she stops because she's evil in the film. She stops playing. The dancers stop, and she turns around and looks right down the barrel of the camera. So that's when they got to pull me out. Right. So that all happens. And then they're like, go, you know, stand next to Guillermo. Go look in the monitor and see. So I'm like, holy shit, this is so cool. Oh, I'm in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> None of this is clicking until I go over. I'm standing beside him, him, and I'm watching the thing on the monitor. And she turns around and I literally gasped out loud, out loud. <laughs> in, the middle, the in the middle of them filming this movie <laughs> and clapped my hand over my mouth. The stopped frame is the the painting oh that I. Oh my god! Wow! It's so shocking, Adrian. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then I'm telling Guillermo this after they have broken, and I'm telling every grip and hand who will listen, <laughs> and I'm I'm looking up pictures on the internet, and I'm like, look at this, look at, this. <laughs> and everyone's like, whoa. So then, fine, and everyone's like, what's all the fuss about? Jessica comes over. Oh wow! She's like. What's going on? I'm like, oh, you know, Jessica, my my new best friend. <laughs> I'm like, I tell her the story. I said, this painting has been with me for 15 years. Oh, that's amazing. This character has been with me. I'm literally wearing the hair and the dress. And that was the shot. Musicians holding stringed instruments around this piano. Wow. I just was in the painting. And I'm I'm her. But I'm like the shadow of her, which is next level Carl Jung. <laughs> and I'm I'm completely like I'm having some kind of moment. Yeah. And she says, she's like, do you know that this stuff happens on his sets all the time? Wow. And I what? said, does it? And I said, what's your character's name? She said, it's Lucille. And I'm like, oh, I don't. that doesn't ring any bells. And she's like, it's the Baroness <gasps> Lucille. No. Yes. <laughs> oh, my and God. So, I am like, I am completely freaked out. So that painting, I hadn't finished the face on her. I hadn't finished the face on the man. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't finished. There was a child in the corner. And it it was a sketch. It was a rough sketch. And this was like sort of a sculpture painting. It was like high density insulation that I had carved to look three-dimensional and then painted. And it looks Mm -hmm. amazing. It looks like wood, but it's, it's super light. So that, those were the unfinished parts of the painting. And a couple years later, still, I had this painting in the house. And I was, I, I decided, because I was, again, at a, at a stuck point in life where I was like, I, mean, I need someone to, like, kick me in the butt and tell me what I should do. So I was talking with this amazing meditation expert woman who is kind of have some, like, you know, she's got some esoteric connections. I don't know what they are, but she was very wise. <laughs> 
And she said, I really wanted to have a child. And she, she's like, what's the status of this painting? And I said, uh, well, the Baroness's face is done. The guy's face is kind of done. The child is a sketch. And she's like, you know what you have to do. Right. And I was like, oh my God, obviously. Right. And part of me too was I, when this whole, I, I want to have a child thing, I was like, the Baroness, Baroness. Oh my God. This character, I was done touring. I was done wearing her as a costume. I had actually gone so full circle that I had ended up in corporeal, temporal, three dimensional reality right. as that woman. The cycle was complete. And yet yeah. I had not psychologically closed that chapter. Oh, man. So I wanted the Baroness out of my house, right? So, and I wanted this child and I wanted to be me, unmasked. I wanted to sing my songs on record and be unafraid to say those things. So this was the whole transformation I was working through to get to Metaphysics, the last album I made. So wanting this child so badly and having no way, I had no partner and you, you know, like dating people going like, I need to have a child in like the next five minutes. <laughs> no like, pressure. It doesn't really work. Yeah. So I, I just was like, I'm just, I have to lay my trust in the universe and I have to, I have to walk my walk. If this is what I believe, because I really do believe that, that, that when we, when we want to know which way to go, we already know. We mm. just have to, let ourselves discover it. We have to wait and see those signs that will always be there. So, and I feel like the signs follow your, they don't proceed. Do you know what I mean by that? It's yep. like the universe isn't going to tell you where to go. Yes. You, you finally discover in yourself where you want to go and the universe goes, Yeah. good job. Yeah. And you get that, that's that weird sign. Right. And I felt like that's what that was on that, on the set of that movie. And then the second part of this story is, wanting this child. So I finish the child in the corner of the painting, the magic painting we are now calling it. <laughs> Out of nowhere, Kevin Hearn from the Bare Naked Ladies calls me up and says, Sarah, I've always loved your visual art. Would you like to have a show with me? Wow. And I'm like, I've always loved your visual art. So yes, <laughs> we schedule a show, an art show. This is around uh, 2019. And I finished this Baroness painting. I finished it, finished the child, did her face, did her hands. The whole thing is finished. So when we go to our opening, Kevin sings and tells some stories. And then, you know, everyone's like, oh, he's so amazing. And then they'll buy all his paintings. <laughs> and then I go up and I sing and I tell stories. And then I say, by the way, this painting, and I, this was before I had met David, had, a, had a, any, like, I was not pregnant. I was just like winging a prayer. And I said to the audience quite boldly, this is very unlike me. I said, <laughs> I really would like to have a child. So I told the story of the movie set and I said, I'm convinced this painting is magic. So I finished the child and now I am setting the Baroness free. Wow. Goodbye, Baroness. I'm now ready to be... The mother, the authentic, real, whole person, myself, whatever it is, whatever the you know magic recipe is, I felt the completion of the Baroness chapter. I no longer. I changed my business name. I used to have emails that were the bar they were all changed. Wow. I completely closed the Baroness, and I and I said this not knowing like it was. A $5,000 painting. I mean, I right. don't know people that would just go like, I'll spend five grand on that. <laughs> so after I sing, I, you know, the audience is visibly moved and they're like, you're gasping at the story. They can't believe it. It's so great. And then the curator comes up to me. She said, you've just sold your first painting. Nice. And she's like, it's the magic painting. Someone bought it before I even told the story. Oh, wow. A woman walked into the gallery as I was getting onto the stage to sing. And she talked to a curator and she said, is that one sold? And he said, no. And she's like, I'll buy it. She didn't even ask how much it was. Wow. Wow. And off she went. And 
a year later, I was pregnant. That's incredible. Wow. <laughs> what a story. That's Sorry, that's, that was uh, really long. <laughs> worth it. That was amazing. Wow. Yeah, if you ever doubt that there's any magic in life, that certainly uh, would, would key you on to something completely different. This podcast is brought to you by the Screen Composers Guild of Canada, celebrating its 40th year in 2020. The SCGC is a national association of professional music composers and producers for film, television, and media, whose mission includes promoting the music, status, and rights for film, television, and media composers in Canada. Special thanks to the SOCAN Foundation for financial support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers. And now, back to our show. In telling that story, you actually answered a lot of my questions about, uh, you know, how art and other things that you're doing sort of figure into stuff. I did want to touch just very quickly because you've, you're you a Gemini-nominated uh, actor, which is, you know, that's one of the highest... Uh, <laughs> that's one of the highest... You did some um, sleuthing, Adrian. Yeah, you know, I found You did a lot of out. digging. Uh, that's one of the highest honors you can receive as an actor in this country. So I, I like, have you ever thought about doing more? Was it something you enjoyed? You know, other side of the camera? I am far too insecure about my physical imperfection to be an actor. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know how they do it. I think every actor feels exactly the same way. Seriously, I don't know how they do it. I am working on a musical right now, composing a bunch of songs about the life of Maud Lewis and Nova Scotian painter Maud Lewis, incredible artist. Oh, cool. Speaking of the universe, this woman was in tune, in tune. Wow. Um, but all of the actors, we've had a, a couple workshops already, and we're going to have another one this year as we sort of audition the songs and um, try to build the show. And I swear to God, acting is is magical. It mm. is it is so difficult. It's yeah. like any of the arts, really, I guess. It's so <clears throat> difficult to make it look easy. Right. And the good ones make it look easy. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've tried, I've done several things. Um, when I was younger, I did a lot of little mini movies and things like that. And yeah, I don't think I'd act again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've already reached the heights of Canadian uh, uh, Cinema Acting Awards, so you don't have any Yeah, look to go. out, Adrian, right? <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Adam McGowan, when, yeah. when's your call? I'll call my people. I'm sure he would cast you in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, but speaking uh, speaking more to what you're working on currently, you uh, recently celebrated the win of a CSA Canadian Screen Award. Congratulations. Uh, for I didn't. Well, I share this award shared with, with yeah, exactly. a lot of absolutely excellent, um, so much more experienced composers than myself. I'm in Batia, Ari Posner, and Antonio, I don't know how to say his last name, Naranjo? I think that's it. I, yeah, I mean, don't, they're all I, I so would, incredible. Don't quote me on that, but that sounds, that's the way I've heard it said. I um, mean, for our first gig, like a first real, like this is what I'm doing. We're doing a series and we're working closely with the director. It was a dream team. Oh, yeah. They were all so amazing. That's, uh, that's an incredible company to be in. But I think from everything uh, that I've heard from you and your whole journey, it seems like you were sort of, you know, driving towards this destination the entire time anyways. But oh, what, where, where did that begin for you? Like, did you, did you have it in mind that eventually this might be a path for you? Did you ever think, oh, you know, I'd like to get into this? I mean, you have all the goods already. Uh, it was just sort of a matter of putting your attention to that. So when did that become a thing where you were like, oh, let's <gasps> do this Didn't that just now. sound like that's a line right out of like a fantasy movie, like Willow or something. The answer's <laughs> all within. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love the tenor of this whole conversation. This is perfect. I do too. <laughs> I, I was hoping it would be like this. Um, you know, I, oh, it's hard to say. I feel like because of the, some of the sort of psychological gymnastics I did to feel comfortable in situations where I was like, mm, I'm not sure this is it. Um, it was, it was difficult for me to, to really say like, no, no, I should have been there or okay. this is where I should go. I was never... I was never going to be a pop star. It is. I just do not. That's not me. And I I was trying to find my place in that industry, and it just never felt right. It never mm -hmm. felt right. So, yeah. but I but I was afforded the tremendous opportunity to record music 
which, you know, I would never trade for anything. Yeah. It was, it was such a gift. So I kind of had the feeling for, uh, you know, a lot of years and it grew in intensity where I was like this, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe, or maybe my time here is done. Maybe I've achieved what I want to achieve here and I'm hungry to grow. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what was really itching at me in around 2017. After I made that record, I had the feeling like this is probably my last record. I've put mm. the Baroness to bed. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you for your gifts. Goodbye. Um, I, I let her go. I I made this unmasked record. And, and so literally, like the front of the record is my face yeah. in black and white. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, no crazy ring light and like weird effects or there's, n it's just me. Yeah. And I closed that book and then I went to the CFC. I was just so intrigued. I had some friends who had gone to the Canadian Film Center and, you know, had a, an amazing time working with filmmakers, working really quickly, um, learning to use all the skills they'd acquired in pop or in advertising or wherever they started from on something like wildly new and creative and maybe not as so embedded in one's own self in, in your name and in your face and like, you know, a big banner to the world. This is what I am. You know, it's like, no, you can just write music for this thing and it can be for that. And then you can write totally different music for another thing. Mm -hmm. And that was really appealing to me. I think the thing about the pop music world that I found so suffocating was that you had to be this massive visual symbol yeah. of your music. Yeah. And your music had to be, everything had to be the same and communicate this one message. And I'm like, oh. my first record, I had like a string octet on it. And then like <laughs> a trashy rock song with like big boisterous drums yeah. and cabaret. Like, you know, I, I don't think I could be a solid brand for you guys. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I, right. I kind of realized that. So I, I just, was very graciously one of my friends um, nominated me for the program. And I, you know, I went in and I did the interview and they're like, why do you want to do this? Like you made all these albums. What are you doing here? And I'm like, I would like to learn. I would like to, to make something that isn't Sarah Sleen. Yeah. And they were like, Hmm. And it was so life affirming and, energizing to be around young filmmakers mm. who, you know, were at that age, like 20, 24 to 28, where they're like, I want to make things, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, you like oh, little chipmunk, oh, I'm like, I just hate you, because I remember being that way and that young and just feeling the fullness of life and, and the the, the fresh opportunities in front of you and the desire to just make as much as you can, all of that. I just, I loved being around them. And I was astonished at some of the stuff they were making, the high, high level mm. of the things that they were creating. And it was so fast. I am such, my friend Rich, formerly Buck65, he used to call me a constipated artist. And <laughs> <laughs> in that oh I was so slow about like, I'd have a little seed and I'd like sprinkle water and I'd gestate that little seed. Oh, come, come, come. Just, you know, grow a little. I was so slow and gentle with my ideas. And he was like, you just need to like make shit and, you know, like, and divorce yourself from it being, you know, this perfect creation right. and something yeah. that you've like, you know, taken out of marble, like chip by chip. He's like, just go fast. Try going fast. Cause I yeah. never worked that way. Right. And CFC forced me to work that way. So that was a really good way of kind of getting less precious about making right. work. Is there a feeling of lightness to the kind of work? I mean, I know it can sometimes be a real grind and depending on who you're working with and what you're doing, but I mean, in terms of, you know, as you're saying, uh, working faster, not being as precious, this, there isn't probably that same process of self excavation and the painful circle that you're going through. I'm assuming it's lighter. It's much lighter because you are, you know, you're, you're, it's, you can't help but bring your skill set of yeah. being on earth for however long you have been and the, and the things you've learned and the way you've 
personally grown, changed, and the way that's affected your creative ability. So you just can't help but bring that, right? Yeah. But the beauty of working on the screen is that it's divorced from you, you. It's divorced from your ego. Yes, we all take great pride in what we're doing. Yes, we want to deliver for that director. We want to elevate the picture. We all care a lot about it, but we care about it. Yeah. We don't care about what does this say about me, you know? And it's just like, it's just that gentle teasing away from the the front facingness of of what pop music was that I felt was the most freeing part of it. You know, it's like I could make any kind of music and I wasn't worried about what it meant in terms of me and who I was presenting to the world. Yeah. So just before we got on, uh, on this chat, I <laughs> sort of bad timing, but I got an email that popped up and it was a music supervisor giving me a list of notes on the first pass of a film that I'm working on right oh, now. No. <laughs> um, as I've gotten, you know, uh, the longer I do this, it feels less like a stab in the heart and more like a punch to the kidney. So it's <laughs> extremely, it's painful, but it's not, it doesn't ruin me entirely. But you're like, oh. Yeah, it's like, ow, oh, that really freaking hurts. Okay, we're going to deal with this. I'll fight through it. Ah, screw this. Um, how do you feel about notes? Like, uh, do you go through a period of grieving? Like, do you have a process for that? It's sort of interesting for me because I think, as I said before, you have all the goods um, to do this job both. And we'll talk about the language aspect of it, which I think is really important. But I mean, in terms of orchestration, in terms of understanding narrative, and in terms of understanding storytelling so well from every single angle, whether it's as an actor, whether it's as a painter, poet, you know, singer, songwriter uh, and everything. So going from what you were doing as an artist and now flipping the script where you are, uh, you know, building somebody else's vision, how do you deal with the notes? You know, right now we're working with just the, the loveliest director ever. He's so funny and he's so, he has such a vision and it's so detailed. And I'm working with two people who are absolute masters at getting really right in there and like narrowing in on exactly what the director wants mm -hmm. from their language, from the, the references they give, and they just know how to deliver. And they're so encouraging to me because, I mean, it's, it's so funny, the last like three episodes of Notes, we have a music editor parsing notes for us, you know, making things really quick, like Sarah, Sarah, Amin, Ari, like just this, these are things that you yeah. have to fix, you have to fix. And the last one was like, Sarah, 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 Sarah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wah, wah. <laughs> and <laughs> I think I sent a trombone emoji to Amin. No, I didn't. But <laughs> he is so encouraging. It's, I feel so spoiled on this gig, truly, because they're just, they're the sweetest guys. And, you know, having not a ton of experience working through this process, I would have been like, whoa, oh God, like I'm, I'm not doing this right. But as mm. the episodes go on and you make these fixes and they're like, that's exactly what I want next. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. Like I know, I know what I'm doing. Process. I know how to do this. Right. And also I have to remind myself, like I'm in an Ari have developed that other skill set that is the the skill set that I am, you know, hoping to earn over the next few years is like they know they really can translate. Mm. They can translate from notes and references really, really quickly. And if yeah. they're not sure, they will send before the director has even asked for a screener, they will send the cue ahead of time. You know, what mm -hmm. about this? And they go, oh, no, no, no. This is what I mean. They can really zero in on it. Yeah. And and they're masters at at relating to directors and developing rapport. It's a, it's, I've said to them both, like it's a masterclass for me to watch their people skills even. You know, because yeah. I don't, I don't have that skill set yet. Of course, I work with all kinds of different people, but not this specific situation. Yeah. And and they're so good at it, and they're so gracious, and they're so humble. And they could write something that is just extraordinary. And if the director's like, no, more like this, boom, they fix it. There's yeah. no ego. There's no hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. The crying all happens in private. <laughs> 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 I just need a minute. I'll be back. <clears throat> That's amazing. 
But you do have a, a, a an incredible facility with language um, in in both the art that you produce and what I have to say are frankly uh, completely compelling and delightful interviews that you give. Um, and somehow you managed to do it all. You you're probably one of the very few artists that I can stand to read talk about their own work because it's not pretentious and you actually have um, illuminating things to say where it's like, Oh, now I understand the work more deeply as opposed to you just tried to give a really fancy sounding answer to something really, there's no, there's no good uh, answer to this um, for, <laughs> you. you know, I read one um, you were describing when you put out land and sea, you were describing in like very, like very uh, high, high sort of uh, granularity uh, the difference between the two, this is a double album, the difference between the two albums in terms of geography, in terms of color, temperature, like there are all these different, very like tactile kind of ways. And it really, as a reader, I was just like, well, now I want to really listen to this album because this sounds really cool. Um, and I have to imagine that this is a huge key for you to understanding how you're working with people who are in the visual medium, that when you're translating, when you're talking about this thing that Amin and Ari are so good at doing this translational thing, uh, you must find that that's a huge help to you. Well, you know, that's an interesting point you make because I feel like music has always been an inner movie mm. to me. That's how I experience it. I experience it as, you know, an environment, uh, you know, a color palette. I experience it as a full sensory thing. It, Amin is a synesthete, and so we've had yeah. we've had discussions about this. He really does see colors for sounds, and I I feel like I'm definitely that way. Chords are colors, but I when I'm writing music, especially music that has a bit of language in it, I really do inhabit a kind of space, and it is an inner movie. And I I guess that's why I wanted to make string octets on my Atlantic debut. <laughs> When they were like, um, you want to do what? <laughs> uh, but I, I re they were all so different and I really would see them. I mean, it's a shame I didn't make more videos. And in videos, they just wanted me like singing the camera, which is like, uh. yeah. but they really were experienced as mini short films to me, like every song. Mm. So I, that's what I love about putting music to picture is like you really – you go into that inner landscape. The, the, the emotions are colors, temperatures, topography. It really is like that. And I feel like that's, um, you know, that's when music really works, you know, like it really gives us feelings Yeah, is, is when it's, when it's inhabiting all of that, it's like three dimensional. When we chatted about this uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, Bernstein's The Un Unanswered Question, which to me is such a fascinating, uh, you know, discussion or thesis or just sort of a, a way of looking at music as language, like literal language, as, in, as why does... Why does this set of chords make me feel this way? Why, why when I listen to, you know, what, um, uh, you know... In Henry V, uh, those climbing chords when when Kenneth Branagh is giving his big speech to the forces, those chords break me up every single time. Or you mentioned, um, you know, John Barry and uh, uh, Out of Africa. I mean, when that main theme, like I had a farm plays, you're just like, yeah, why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what what is your yes. what do you feel about that? Like when you're when you're composing and especially for like when you see something visually or you see you have a, a film or a visual narrative and you're trying to say something more than what's already there, obviously, mm -hmm. and trying to contribute to that narrative and a feeling that you want to instill in the audience. How do you and I, I think I also mentioned like a few of the chord changes you were doing on some of the tracks on uh, on your 2017 album. And how I was like, oh, I, I feel where you're going there. Like I have a spiritual mm -hmm. connection to those those chord movements. How do you think about that in terms of what you try to say with music? What a fascinating question. Oh, God, it's so nice talking to musicians. Like, <laughs> wow. Um, I truly think that book is a fascinating thing to read. And I think musicians of all cultures, like he breaks down a lot of Mozart and he talks about Chomsky 
and how, you know, Chomsky's discovery or thesis that, you know, there's an inherent grammar or syntax sort of setting in our brains and that, you know, languages trigger it, but it's innate. Um, and Bernstein was trying to say that there's a similar syntax to music. And he breaks down, I think he breaks down Mozart, one of Mozart's symphonies, but you know, like I think that's why there there's some there would be some cultural differentiation to this right. for sure. But in terms of Western classical music, to me it there's so many gestures, cadences, rhythms, um, you know, units that seem to to be elemental. Mm. If that makes sense. And that we can put together in a syntax that will produce a certain kind of emotion almost universally, or it's certainly within a culture, mm -hmm. you know, like we will all feel profound poignancy listening to Max Richter, like on the nature of daylight. That's what happens. Like, it's just like he put the key in and he turned it, you know? And I think there's something to that. Um, but I also feel like there's music is physics, right? Sound is physics. And like, we are, like I said before, we are matter. And there's so much about us that is echoed in music. The rhythm of our walking, our heart beating, all of these things are echoed in music. But there's so much about a beautiful melody that sounds like someone speaking. And the, do you know what I mean? And the, and the yeah. way that a sentence is shaped, the way a question is shaped, the way that language tumbles, or the way that um, cer certain melodies to me are so bodily. They're so physical. Mm -hmm. They're so, that's why like dance is such a profound art. And I don't see enough of dance, but when I see it, I'm like, there's the music on stage. There is the music. Yeah. It's right there. <laughs> like I'm looking at music and yeah, I just think that that's a, a thing we cannot escape as, as corporeal, if that's the way you say that word, I believe it is beings as three yeah. dimensional meat sack beings <laughs> in this physical world, you know, like. All of those things are, you know, we can manipulate those as as musical composers. Mm -hmm. We can echo those. We can remind. We can suggest. Yeah. I've been really fascinated with the idea of uh, mnemonics recently where uh, in order to convey a certain emotion or to convey a certain idea within a piece of music that isn't uh, vocal, I'll employ the use of mnemonics and, and phrases within that are never spoken or sung, but still have that uh, a beat to them that suggests something like mm -hmm. I love you or mm -hmm. time to say goodbye, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things where you, where you sing it. And for me, maybe that's just a personal thing. Maybe it's only for me and it gets me to where I need to go by going, well, uh, maybe goodbye needs a different cadence or maybe love mm -hmm. needs the stress on that syllable. And then it, it comes out of the music and you're like, they take the template away and you're like, oh, this works now emotionally. So basically what you're to. saying, Adrian, is you're a frustrated songwriter. <laughs> Very frustrated. <laughs> and when I write songs, oh, it's so frustrating. Why, why did I write this terrible song? No, actually that's a lot of the way I feel like so many songwriters, it is so obvious that that's part of their process. Leonard Cohen being one, the mm. innate rhythms in language right. are his tool. Yeah. And the tool he leans on the hardest, because let's face it, he's not a singer, right? Yeah, like right. he leans on that so hard and he he uses the restrictions of a certain form uh, where you know, like a poetic form, and look at what he can do. You know, like yeah. but it's all it's the the language itself, it's almost like it it suggests the song to him and out it tumbles. A lot of songwriters work that way. So what's been on your mind recently? What what have you been, what's been obsessing you? Uh, what have you been focused <laughs> on? Obsessing. Oh, in, I can show you something. Sense. I'll have to move my hammer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> random. had a hammer in my room. I've just moved. There's crap everywhere. You can't see the chaos. It's all down there. Um, <laughs> this has been obsessing me. I ordered this. Oh, yes. Great. So when I worked with... Um, Vince Mendoza with the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra uh, about four years ago, three or four years ago, I was, we were playing the scores of his arrangements of the Joni Mitchell songs. And we did a full concert of his, of pieces from her travelogue record, which are like reimagined, orchestrated, and they're so beautiful. Oh my and God. I yeah. Was so I think one of my, uh, 
uh, is it what's the tune about clouds again? Um, that's it. Cla- uh, that that right there. I think that is Mendoza who did that rendition, which is these slow, now. like undulating oh. chords that are like completely reimagined the setting. And it's just like, what? Uh, I looked on? at the score last night and I was like, oh, I get chills looking at the score. It's really simple. It's very simple. He took one gesture. It's only French horns, uh, trombones, tuba, like a nice, a fairly large brass section and a big string section. That's it. No winds. And just like, you know, jazz rhythm section, laying it down and then Smokey Joni. And it is exquisite. Yeah. And when I was working with him and I was just kind of like trying to stay out of the way, (laughs) I looking over his shoulder and looking at the scores and stuff, he said to me, the only score you need to study is Rite of Spring. Really? That's what he said to me. Not Ravel, but right. Okay. Interesting. Rite of Spring. Yeah. And he said, everything is in there. I also ordered Daphnis and Chloe. I know I'm right there with you, Adrian, but I, I love Vince's work. And I I feel like that was the zone. Like I don't have the jazz language that he has. Um, But that's kind of the zone that I have been loving living in for the past you know, five or six years when I've been working a lot with orchestras Mm -hmm. is that I will orchestrate some work of my own, like songs of mine um, for orchestra, or I will hire friends, gifted composers to kind of reimagine, or I will work with um, amazing jazz people like Mike Jansen, who, you know, orchestrates. um, We did musical theater songs um, and we did those with a few orchestras and I sang, which is completely wild. Um, but I like, I like, cause every time I do a project with an orchestra, I learn something else, you yeah. know? And it's like, there's so, there's only so much you can learn on your own DAW and doing score study, but being there and going, oh, that's how that changes that. Or watching a good conductor sculpt the sound to balance it or to just get more out of the score. That is so instructive. And also hearing my own scores and going like, oh God, I know what I would do differently next time, you know? It's it's invaluable. So that's why I revered Vince so much is because he, that's all he does. He does like jazz, um, at like heavy, heavy orchestrations of like wild, new, interesting, but not classical yeah. stuff. So yeah. when he said that to me, I was like, going to get that immediately. I'm obsessed with it. I'm, uh, I'm in a master's right now at York and I'm doing uh, a sort of self-directed orchestration study. So this figures in um, the Daphnis and Chloe does, and I'm also going to end up writing a piece um, if I can ever carve out enough time. But <laughs> I, I'm super excited because it's slow going to picking up these really uh, like lasting insights, but it does happen. So I'm just you know trying to to suck it all in because every new thing I do, I just get more. I learn more. It's a wild beast in orchestra. It's there's huh. so many variables, right? There's so many colors still available, but, and I've been so lucky to work with people like Kevin Lau and like I said, Mike Jansen. So that's my zone. I'm really excited about that. That's, um, that's really cool. And what else was going to say? Oh, I'm working on Detention Adventure, obviously. Yeah. Such a great show. So smart. It's like as funny as The Simpsons in my view. The writing on it <laughs> is so funny. I mean, kids will laugh and be scared and like find it cool and all that, but also adults will laugh. Oh, that's great. Um, it's so funny. And then I'm also working on that that musical. And I'm also on the SOCAN board. Yeah, right. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm fighting for screen composers. Yeah. What I know you had some you had some stuff about copyright IP, what we're what we're looking at moving into the future, you know, because you were sort of at the you no know, tail end of the whole major label uh world. And now you're you've sort of been front and center essentially to seeing how all these things are changing. And now you're in a new uh, industry with the screen composers. What, what are your views on that? Like, where where do you sort of see? Where do you see where we're at? What are your concerns? And what do you see for the future? I'm excited to be on the board right now because I feel like it's a really crucial time. I feel like SoCan is perfectly positioned. I mean, it's it's a pressure cooker right now. The, the mm. pressure right now to erode copyright and to to sort of devalue and diminish uh, what creative professionals do is so intense, especially in music. It's so intense right now that it feels like, you know, it's from all sides and, you know, 
how the hell are we going to withstand this? Right. But I feel like SOCAN is uniquely positioned to do so, and we should be doing so, and we should um, join forces with all the other great organizations like the SAC, the SCGC, um, uh, Screen Composers Guild Canada, yes, and all these people that are are fighting for creators because I just, this is the thing that would never, it, it came into full focus for me sort of halfway through the my pop career when I started to really take the reins myself. It's like, there's no music industry without musicians. Mm -hmm. Like, we're what all the fuss is about. Not you guys, not the suits. I understand that they're necessary and a lot of them are well-meaning. <laughs> And, and tons of them are extremely helpful and ethical and all that. But I think we can lose sight of the fact that in so many models, the artist is the last person to get paid, is the last person to get a, a reasonable living, to get any sort of wage protection, to get any kind of, you know, quality of life assurance. Yeah. And that royalties have always been how people manage to do it and how this, this world of people making new and beautiful things, which are valuable to productions, how it exists. Right. And so we have to stand up against these massive uh, tech giants that kind of want to go, ah, you know, <laughs> we have to, and, and do so ethically and do so cooperatively, right? Like the world changes, media change. It's cool. But we can't forget that music has value. It simply does. And if it didn't, you'd all be watching silent films and going, why does this suck? You know, like <laughs> right. I will never forget being at CFC and getting raw footage from filmmakers, gifted filmmakers, beautiful cinema, like colors, beautiful production design, beautiful. Yeah. Dead without music. Yeah. Dead, lifeless, not a film. Right. And then you put music to it. The right music, the right composer, and my God, it's it's art. You know, it it jumps off the screen, it moves you, it affects you, it feels like a movie. So I'm just, I don't have all the info yet. I'm trying to catch up on like the evolution of IP law in Canada. I'm trying to follow the Supreme Court arguments that were recent as last week. I'm I'm being schooled by all the great people at SoCan, but it is my ardent wish to contribute in some way to making um, artists more fairly compensated, to safeguarding the profession of being an artist in the world. That's wonderful. Well, we couldn't be in better hands, I'm sure. <laughs> What's um, any parting words or, or uh, asks, advice, insights? I mean, you've already given us so much, but if you had anything that we, or maybe any questions I didn't ask that you want to go over. Oh, let me think. Well, you were going to ask me what I was fascinated with. Oh yes. Well, I thought that was the I thought that was the uh, Stravinsky, but uh, yes. Oh, please. I am fascinated with the Stravinsky for sure. Uh, what else am I fascinated with? Um, I found a new songwriter that I love. Okay. I absolutely love, and I think maybe more people should know about. Great. His name is Sam Weber. Okay. He's Canadian. Oh my God, his songs are beautiful. They're beautiful. I just randomly heard a song on the radio the other day on CBC, and I was like, what? Um. What else? Um, yeah, I think that's maybe it. And if I think of something, I'll I'll uh, I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do. Sam Weber, uh, W E B E R, I guess. Great. I'll I'll look that up. Uh, my on most weeknights from eight to uh, midnight, you can find me sitting on the couch listening to Odario because that's where I get all my new music picks. You know, it's so yeah. He's, he's, he's got a great, great taste. He really Super does. Super taste. I love it. <laughs> So where can people find you? Uh, uh, obviously, please, people, listen to Sarah Sleen. Uh, buy her albums and her artwork. And uh, if, <laughs> if if nothing else, check her out on Spotify. Uh, the catalog, the 11 albums, so wide, so so much breadth, so much depth. I mean, more than anything, um, a, a person who can plumb the depths of the soul and bring back these gifts uh, without any artifice, <laughs> like just genuine beautiful, uh, heartwarming and uplifting, uh, stuff. So I really hardly recommend you check out everything that she does, but where can people find out more, follow you online, uh, keep you connected to social media cause you love it so much. <laughs> That's so kind of you to say, Adrian, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. Um, I'm of course all over the internet. <gasps> 
sarahsleen.com is my website. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's about all I can handle at this point. Good. I have a child. How much time do you want me to spend on my phone all day? Really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm, I, I do enjoy Twitter. I mean, I know that's like old now, but I do enjoy Twitter just for the, the sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You can find Sarah being sarcastic on Twitter all day long. <laughs> well, this has been an absolute delight. You've completely over-delivered. Uh, it's been such a joy talking to you. And uh, all the best. And let's uh, let's keep in touch. I can't wait to see what's next for you. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. Nice to see your face. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider showing your support by giving the show a five-star rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. The Screen Composer Studio is produced by myself, Adrian Ellis. Graphics and post-production assistance by Nick Grimshaw. Special thanks to our managing director, Tanya Dedrick, as well as Charlie Finley, Elizabeth Hannon, and Guggen Singh for their support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers or reach out at tscs at screencomposers.ca.